one week in Portugal, the highlight seven-day itinerary. Though Portugal isn't a large country, there's still no shortage of things to do, see, and experience. Between geographically varying regions, unique landscapes, and must-see cities scattered around the country, not to mention some really amazing culinary options, you might have a hard time deciding what to do first. Factoring in the city in which you'll arrive, the weather conditions when you do, and the types of sights you're dying to see, we've got you covered for a one-week Portugal itinerary, no matter where your interests lie. Plus, even if you don't get to everything during your seven days in Portugal, that just gives you an excellent reason for a return trip. Lisbon. This one-day itinerary will get you to the best sites in Lisbon comfortably and ensure you miss none of the must-see attractions. Visit the iconic attractions like Castelo de São Jorge, Musu da Roque and Geronimo's Monastery. Get a bird's-eye view of the city from Miraduro de São Pedro de Alcântara. The itinerary includes beautiful structures like the Padrão dos Descobrimentos and Bolem Tower. Castelo de São Jorge. St. George's Castle looks down over Lisbon and is a major landmark that can be seen from anywhere in the city. The oldest portions of the castle structure dates back to the ancient Romans followed by the Visigoths and then the Moors. The castle or citadel was a Moorish palace fortified in the 11th century. When the city was taken by King Afonso Enrique I in 1147 aided by the northern European crusaders the castle became a royal residence as well as the royal court, home to the bishop and the royal archives. In thanks for the crusaders help the castle was named after the patron saint of England, St. George. This act of allegiance also symbolized the Anglo-Portuguese Pact which was signed in 1371. The castle was the site of many important events and coronations. In 1580 Portugal joined the Spanish crown and the purpose of the castle became more military. This continued into the early 20th century. The structure suffered damage from the 1755 earthquake and underwent many renovations which covered up the historic monument. The fortified walls and the original 18 towers survived the earthquake. Today we can see the remains of the royal palace and castle in the archaeological exhibit of the castle and the citadel has been restored to its former glory. Visitors to the castle can climb to the ramparts and get views across the city. There is a beautiful castle garden where ducks, peacocks and geese roam freely. In the Tower of Ulysses you can see Camara Escura. This periscope machine projects images of the city. The castle has three underground chambers where there is a small archaeological museum. One of these rooms is where Vasco da Gama was received by the king. Above the main entrance of the castle you can see the coat of arms of Portugal and the date 1846. From here you enter the main square within the castle walls. Here there are old cannons and a statue of Afonso Henriquez. From here you can reach the ruins of the former royal palace which now hosts a multimedia show about Lisbon's history. Miraduro de São Pedro de Alcântara. No alt text provided for this image. This is one of several observation points overlooking the city and the most popular of the lookout points. It is located in the Barro Alto neighborhood in the Jardim Antonio Nobra and is also referred to as Belvedere which means beautiful vantage point. From here you can get brilliant views of St. George's Castle, say Cathedral. São Vicente da for a church and the city center. At the site there is an Osulejo ceramic tile map of the view and all the points of interest are indicated. The garden is on two levels and in the landscaped geometric gardens on the lower terrace you can see busts of local heroes and of Greco-Roman mythological gods. The upper level is the most popular and here you can enjoy many trees, benches and a statue of a founder of a local newspaper, Eduardo Qualo. There is a Baroque-style fountain which adds to the garden's charm. During the day the garden is peaceful and quiet, but at night local teenagers like to hang out here. Reaching the observation point is an attraction in itself as you can travel up to the top of the hill on the Gloria elevator from Restrador Square. The funicular dates back to 1885. If you are looking for sites nearby, there is the Solar do Vinho do Porto, Port Wine Institute, where you can taste wines in an 18th-century building. Musu São Roque and Sacred Art Museum. No alt text provided for this image. The museum and church stand side by side, from the outside they are not impressive, but the interior is one of the most stunning churches in the city. The church was commissioned by the Jesuits and designed by Filippo Terzi, who also designed the São Vicente Church. As you enter the church you will not know where to look first. Above the nave is a painted wood ceiling and along the sides of the nave are eight chapels with splendid Baroque art. The 16th-century Jesuit church's most famed attraction is the Chapel of St. John created by Luigi Van Vitelli. 
The chapel was assembled in Rome using the most opulent materials like lapis lazuli, gold and alabaster then it was shipped to Lisbon and reassembled in 1747. The chapel is said to be the world's most expensive. In the church sacristy are scenes depicting the lives of the Jesuit saints. The church also holds several sacred relics including a thorn from Jesus' crown of thorns and a piece of wood said to have come from Christ's crib. Adjacent to the church is a museum, Musu de Arte Sacra or the Museum of Sacred Art. Here you can see liturgical garments, vestments and religious objects. There are intricately embroidered capes and gold and silver religious object encrusted with jewels. The bronze and silver torch holders are just a few of the highlights. There are also a collection of Baroque silver and 16th-century paintings. Geronimo's Monastery. No alt text provided for this image. This is a monastery of the Military Order of St. Jerome, it is an outstanding example of late Gothic Manuline architecture and is a UNESCO site. The monastery was constructed on the orders of King Manuel I near the site of an earlier 5th-century church of Santa Maria de Belém. It was completed c.1601 and given to the Order of St. Jerome. It remained the headquarters for this religious community until 1833. The large monastery complex stands on the bank of the River Tagus. The structure has been an integral part of Portuguese history for the last five centuries. The building was the burial place of royals and the site is famed as being where Vasco da Gama spent the night before leaving for his expedition to the Orient. Architectural highlights include the South Portal, a large and ornate entrance way designed by Juan de Castillo. The portal resembles a shrine and rises 32 meters in the air and is 12 meters wide. It has Gothic pinnacles, scenes from the life of St. Jerome, a statue of Henry the Navigator and other statues. The axial portal is a smaller entrance but has an important location in front of the main altar. The portal was created by Nicolaus Chanterine in 1517 and has many embellishments and carvings. Inside the monastery complex there is the magnificent church by Diogo Boitac and continued by Juan de Castillo, with a very high single-spanned ribbed vaulted ceiling. In the lower choir you can see the tomb of da Gama, 1468-1523, and Luis de Camoyanche, 1527-1570. The monastery has a large cloister with wide arches surrounding the courtyard. Each archway is adorned with manuline motives, nautical themes and motifs taken from the European, Islamic and Eastern traditions. In the monastery refectory you can see 17th-century azulejos tiles. Pedreo dos Descobrimentos. No alt text provided for this image. You can't help seeing this monument on the edge of the river. It is dedicated to the 15th to 16th century age of discovery when Portuguese explorers set out across the oceans to seek the new world. It was from this point where the ships would set sail to far-off destinations like India and the Far East. The monument was designed by José Ángelo Cotinelli Telmo and created by Leopoldo de Almeida in 1939 as a temporary attraction for the Portuguese World Fair of 1940. The monument was dismantled after the exposition but in 1960 was reconstructed, this time as a permanent feature on the water's edge and under the direction of architect Antonio Pardal Montero and engineer Edgar Cardoso. The rededication of the monument coincided with the anniversary of the death of Henry the Navigator. The monument depicts famous explorers and is shaped symbolically like the prow of a ship. It is made from rose-colored stone with statues carved from limestone. For those who want to do more than see the monument from the ground there is an observation deck, auditorium and exhibition hall within the structure. On the ground you can see a compass rose and map a Mundi mosaic which was a gift from the South African government. The 52-meter-high slab of stone which rises vertically represent a ship's sail and on the prow of the ship are statues of famous age of discovery navigators as well as important figures of the time like kings, explorers, cartographers, scientists, and artists. At the front of the line of statues is Henry the Navigator. Other figures include Vasco da Gama, Alfonso V, João de Barros and Pedro Nunes among others. Belém Tower. No alt text provided for this image. This impressive defense tower, officially called Torre de Sa Vicente, was constructed on a rock outcrop in the Tagus River, but over the years the water levels have changed and it is now on the bank of the river so visitors can walk right up to it across a small bridge. The tower was completed in 1520 during the reign of Manuel I as one of a series of defense towers built to protect the harbor. Sailors and explorers would see the tower as they approached the harbor and it became an iconic symbol of home. The tower is a UNESCO site.
The exterior is definitely more interesting than the interior, so if you only have a short time in Lisbon it is worth seeing from the outside. It is possible to make out two distinct architectural styles in the building structure. It has North African Moorish watchtowers, Gothic features, stands 30 meters high and has four levels. It was constructed using off-white local limestone and is divided into the lower bastion and the tower. There is an interesting carving of a rhinoceros which must have been a rare sight in Europe at the time. There are shield-shaped battlements and manuline stone detail on the facade including nautical motifs, twisted ropes and crosses. Inside the lower level was used as a prison and the middle floor was used to store ammunition and armor. On the top floor you can see the tower's best decoration. Inside you can see the rib vaulted ceilings. Sintra. 1 slash Palacio Nacional de Pena and Gardens. No alt text provided for this image. Pena Palace, perched on top of a rocky peak, has history dating back to the Middle Ages. Originally a chapel dedicated to the Virgin Mary it became a monastery in the 15th century. In the 18th century, a lightning strike and earthquake reduced much of it to ruins. But a young prince, later to become King Ferdinand II, wowed by the ruins, purchased the old monastery, the nearby castle of the Moors and the surrounding land. He set about converting the monastery into a summer palace. But it would be no ordinary summer palace. The old monastery was rebuilt along with a new European grand house all surrounded by the battlements, watchtowers, and drawbridge of a faux castle. Islamic and medieval Christian influences are spread throughout the palace with tiles, vaulted arches and intricate carvings dominating the interior. With a bright yellow monastery, a rustic red castle and ornate battlements the whole site could easily feel gaudy, tacky and cheap. It's all of those things but somehow manages to win you over. Ferdinand also meticulously landscaped most of the grounds. Birds frolic in man-made lakes surrounded by over 500 different species of trees. Sequoias and eucalyptus trees, introduced over the years, tower over a mix of ferns and colorful flowers. It's a beautiful spot. This place would be the birth of European Romanticism, a movement that celebrated combining both the beauty of the past and of nature. The result is decorative and flamboyant buildings, of which Pena Palace is the greatest. UNESCO made this place a World Heritage Site in 1995, and it is easy to see why. How T.O. get there slash take a tuk-tuk or a bus from Sintra Station to the lower entrance at Pena Palace. The queues at the lower entrance are shorter than at the main entrance and it is a beautiful walk up through the gardens to the palace. Allow 1 hour 30 minutes to explore the grounds and palace. Pena Palace and Gardens slash High Season, 9.30 to 20 hundred hours, Gardens, 9.45 to 18.30, Palace, Low Season, 10 to 18 hundred hours with last admission one hour before closing, price, 7 euros and 50 cents gardens and palace exterior, 14 euros for gardens, palace exterior and palace interior, bookings, book online to save queuing and for a 5% discount. 2 slash Costello dos Muros. No alt text provided for this image. Astelo dos Muros sits on another rocky peak of the hill just a few hundred meters away. It was built in the 8th and 9th centuries by the Moors, Muslims that occupied the Iberian Peninsula at the time. Its vantage point allowed it to control the Atlantic coast and the inlet to Lisbon. But it was not enough and after Lisbon fell in 1147 the castle was captured to the Christian King Alfonso Henriquez. In 1755 an earthquake destroyed much of the castle leaving the tower in ruins. But just as he had renovated the monastery, in 1839 King Ferdinand II began restoring the castle as well. He rebuilt the chapel, repaired the walls and reforested the area. The castle is now a sight to behold with its walls meandering up and down the contours of the hill. Each turret provides excellent views over the surrounding area. Inside, an interpretation center highlights its Moorish history with artifacts found during various digs. How T.O. get there slash exit the Pena Palace at the main entrance, turn left on the road and after a couple of minutes you will arrive at the Moorish Castle ticket office. The castle is another five-minute walk beyond the ticket office. Moorish Castle slash 930 to 1900 hours, high season, 10 to 1700 hours, low season, last admission one hour before closing, price, 8 euros, bookings, book online for a 5% discount and to avoid the queues. 3 slash historic center of Sintra. No alt text provided for this image. There is no denying that the center of Sintra Old Town can be busy and the restaurants touristy but it's not as bad as it could be. 
Take a stroll along the pedestrianized cobblestone streets and narrow stairways admiring the cute shops, churches, and townhouses. Grab lunch at Tascantiga, which serves excellent tapas on the southern edge of town, before stopping off a parakeeta too for either the fine pastel de nata or the even better chocolate salami, a slice of chocolate log packed with nuts and biscuits. Refreshed and energized head towards Quinta de Rigalera. How T.O. get there slash exit the Moorish castle and head into Sintra Old Town. Walk the path sign to Sintra which runs down the east side of the hill, then turns left at the main road into Sintra Old Town, 20 minutes. Alternatively, head back to the ticket office and get the bus into town. For slash Quinta de Rigalera. No alt text provided for this image. What Ferdinand began, others would follow. More flamboyant decorative houses and gardens would be built in the area. One of the more impressive is Quinta de Rigalera which was completed in 1910. The property consists of an ornate palace, a small chapel and an expansive park. The palace is impressive enough with Gothic turrets rising into the air and ornate features carved into the façade. But the real attraction is the remarkable gardens. Inspired by the mythological beliefs of the owner, every corner of the park has something hidden in the vegetation. Disney-like turrets and castellated walls poke through the trees. Grottoes, fountains, ponds and benches lurk in the undergrowth. The star attraction of Quinta de Rigalera is the deep well that tunnels into the ground with steps spiraling down to the bottom. It's worth waiting behind the hordes of people trying desperately to snap selfies in very poor light. A secret tunnel takes you over a cute bridge to exit the well. Visiting here is a voyage of discovery and every step brings a bit of intrigue. How T.O. get there slash it's a short 12-minute walk along the main road from the center of Sintra Old Town West to Quinta de Rigalera. Allow yourself at least 1 hour 30 minutes to explore the house and grounds. Quinta de Rigalera slash 930 to 20 hundred hours, high season, 930 to 18 hundred hours, low season, last admission 1 hour before closing, price, 6 euros tour. To understand more about Quinta de Rigalera and its association with the Freemasons, this tour also includes a drive along the Estoril coast. 5 slash Palacio Nacional de Sintra. No alt text provided for this image. If you have been quick you may just have time to look around the inside of the National Palace of Sintra. The National Palace was originally one of two Moorish castles in Sintra, the other Costello do Muros at the top of the hill. But nothing built during Moorish time has survived. Instead what stands here now was constructed by Christian kings in the 15th and 16th centuries. It still contains significant Gothic, Renaissance and Moorish influences and being inhabited for much of the last 500 years, it's currently the best preserved medieval royal residence in Portugal. Even if you don't quite have time to look around, it is worth admiring the white conical turrets rising from the palace roof that were added in the early 15th century by King John. How T.O. get there slash exit the grounds of Quinta de Rigalera and make the 12-minute return walk to Palacio Nacional de Sintra, which sits in the center of the old town. As the palaces close and your day comes to an end either take the 10-minute walk back to Sintra station or hop on the bus one last time. Palacio Nacional de Sintra slash 930 to 1900 hours, high season, 930 to 1800 hours, low season, last admission half an hour before closing, price. 9 euros and 50 cents. Bookings, book online to save queuing and for a 5% discount. Queenbra. No alt text provided for this image. Queenbra is usually forgotten on most suggestions of day trips from Lisbon. Granted, hopping on the train for less than an hour to visit Sintra or Cascais is easier, but why not go on a little adventure and spend one day in Queenbra? If you were given the chance to spend just one day in Queenbra, these are my best tips to make the best of the center region city. Some interesting facts about Coimbra. Coimbra is famous for its university, there's a reason why they call it the city of students, and its fathu, even more mournful and painful than the fathu you'll hear in Lisbon and, traditionally, sung only by male students. Until the late 1200s the city by the Mondego River was the capital city of Portugal and the city where the king at the time, D. Dinis, resided. It was also this king who founded the University of Coimbra, the first public university in Portugal and one of the oldest in the world. Incidentally, the university was first established in Lisbon and only in 1537 it was physically transferred to Coimbra. But this is a minor detail. Once the University of Coimbra, always the University of Coimbra and that's that. It still stands as one of the most prestigious higher education schools in Portugal.
with an area of a little over 123 square miles and a population of 143,000 plus people, the city might come across as small but, historically and architecturally, it has plenty to keep you busy during one whole day. How to reach Coimbra? By car, you can take Highway A1, and it's about a two-hour drive from Lisbon, from Lisbon to Coimbra it's about 210 kilometers slash 130 miles, and a one-hour drive from Porto, about 122 kilometers slash 75 miles away. By train, it depends on your budget. If you choose the Alpha Pendular, the most expensive, but the most comfortable, too, it's about a 1h45 trip each way, and tickets for a return trip start at 30 euros, $35, per passenger. The Intercidades is still quite comfortable and a bit more affordable, at around 20 euros, $23, per passenger for one return trip, although, it does raise your travel time to about 2 hours each way, so, keep in mind it's a 4-hour period that you'll be traveling by train. In a heartbeat, I would choose the train over driving but, unfortunately, my list of things to do and see in Coimbra that follows isn't within a short walking distance from the train station. I leave that decision up to you and your preferences. Top things to see and do in Coimbra. Unless you fall madly in love at first sight with Coimbra and want to stay longer, one day in Coimbra is enough to visit the top landmarks, roam around the old streets and alleys of the city, and gaze at the River Mondego. These are the absolute must-see landmarks in Coimbra that you don't want to miss. No alt text provided for this image. Church of Santa Cruz. The construction of this church began in 1131, and you can see all the additions that were made in the decor. It beautifully mixes elements of Romanesque, and of Manuline, and of the Renaissance, and of Baroque. It's where the first king of Portugal, Afonso Henriquez, and his son the second king of Portugal, Sancho I, are buried. Address, Praca 8 de Mayo. Opening hours, N.A. Se Velha. No alt text provided for this image. Coimbra's old cathedral was built in the second half of the 12th century and, although its main bones are Romanesque, it is a mix of several art periods too when it comes to the decor. Concerts often happen on this medieval church's steps where the former students of the University of Coimbra, dressed in their black suits and long black cloaks, which is their typical college uniform, gather to sing Fathu and serenade the city, they call it the former student serenade, Serenata dos Antigos Estudantes. Address, Largo Se Velha. Opening hours, N.A. Universidade de Coimbra. No alt text provided for this image. The university is a big part of the city life and history. It is also where you will likely spend most of your time, not only for the history but the breathtaking views of the city. Climbing the legendary 125 steps of the monumental stairs leads you to a campus that oozes the energy of the fighting spirit of the students, mostly famous for the 1969 academic crisis when they manifested against conservative dictatorship and in favor of more rights, democracy, and better education. To visit the historical buildings around campus costs between 12 euros and 15 euros, if you want the audio guided tour, or between US $14 and US $17 per person and I highly recommend it. At every location, they had a laminated sheet of paper that summed up what we were visiting. It included visiting the Biblioteca Jonina, a Baroque monument, beautifully decorated in gilded chinoiserie, the academic prison, a prison for the convicted students and scholars, the St. Michael's Chapel, with a beautiful 1733 Baroque organ, and the University Tower. You won't be allowed to take pictures inside these sites, but the views of the city and the river from the campus will make up for it. I asked the employees to access the small terrace just at the end of the long corridor opposite Sala das Armas, Weapons Room, for a better and clearer view of Coimbra, Mondego, and the surrounding mountains. Slightly windy, me and my fear of heights, but very worth it. Address, Largo de Portaferia. Opening hours, 9 a.m. to 7.30 p.m., summers, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. and 2 to 5 p.m., school season, October Mar. Where to eat in Coimbra. Last, but not least, the most important item on all cultural travel itineraries. No? Eating is part of culture, so I'm gonna go with a resounding yes. Being the city of students comes in handy if you want to eat hearty meals at affordable prices. Not surprisingly, the restaurant we chose to eat in Coimbra was the recommendation of an old friend, a former university student who used to live in the city and knew his way around. The restaurant has a peculiar name, Ze Manal dos Osos, translated into English is something like Bones Joe, I told you, peculiar, but everyone who lives or has lived in Coimbra recommends the place.
There's nothing fancy about the food, on the contrary, but it's typical Portuguese cuisine, well-cooked, well-seasoned, and budget-friendly. As usual in these places, portions are beyond generous, you have to like meat, this tavern-like restaurant is known for its goatling and wild boar dishes, and everything tastes better if you wash it down with a glass of the Beirada region's red wine. Address, Bico do Forno, 12. Opening hours, noon to 3 p.m. and 7.30 to 10 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Average price per meal per person, 12 euros and 50 cents slash US $14.77. Porto. No alt text provided for this image. Take your time and enjoy Porto in one day. Take your time enjoying Porto with this one-day laid-back itinerary. It includes the must-see sites like the Palacio de Bolsa and Church of San Francisco, but all at a leisurely pace. Take a relaxing stroll along the waterfront at Cais de Ribera and see the Dom Luis Bridge. The Porto Cathedral is another top attraction included in this easy-going itinerary. Ride the funicular dos guindais from the lower to upper part of the city which is fun, practical and easier than walking. Palacio de Bolsa. No alt text provided for this image. His national monument is a neoclassical building which dates back to 1842 and was designed by Joaquim de Costa Lima Jr. It is the headquarters of the Commercial Association of Porto and a cultural conference center. The building was only completed in 1910 and the interior was designed by several well-known architects and artists. Visitors can walk through the palace rooms and see gorgeous architecture and decoration including the famous Arabian Room. The Arabian Hall was inspired by the Alhambra Palace and construction began in 1862. It was completed in 1880 in the Moorish Revival style. It has a fine wood floor and intricately decorated columns, ceiling, and walls. This room is used for concerts and special occasions. The Gallery of Former Presidents displays portraits of presidents of the Commercial Association of Porto. There is a library holding priceless books which is not open to the public. The gorgeous Hall of Nations is a courtyard with a glass and metal dome ceiling designed by Tomas Soler, a ceramic mosaic floor and is surrounded by the coats of arms of countries which Portugal traded with at the time. There is a grand staircase to the first floor which was designed by Goncalves e Souza and a ceiling above the stairs featuring frescoes by Antonio Romalho. The granite stairs are decorated with stone carvings of vines, garlands, flowers and columns. There are two chandeliers hanging above the stairs one of which was the first to be installed with electricity in Porto. The courtroom features colored glass, large wall paintings and wooden furniture. Other rooms include the room of juries, room of telegrafo, office of Gustav Eiffel, the president's office, golden hall, room of general meetings and the hall of pictures decorated in the Louis XVI style with an unusual floor. Some of the furniture in the palace was designed by José Márquez de Silva and there are pieces by José María Veloso Salgado, Joao Márquez de Oliveira and Teixeira López. Church of São Francisco. No alt text provided for this image. Igreja de São Francisco is Porto's most famous church. The Gothic-style church has interior Baroque decoration although its exterior is Gothic-style with a rose window. It was originally constructed for use by the Franciscan Order in 1223 but the church gained its famous interior decoration in renovations carried out in the 17th and 18th centuries by Felipe da Silva and Antonio Gomez. The interior is lavishly decorated with more than 350 kilometers of gold covering intricately carved wood. The church has a vaulted ceiling, marble Gothic arches, beautiful thick stone columns and walls decorated with cherubs, rose garlands, animal images and vines. There is a nave with three aisles with three chapels, a transept and an apse at the eastern end. There is a polychrome granite statue of St. Francis of Assisi dating back to the 13th century. Due to the overwhelming amount of gold in the church it has been nicknamed the Church of Gold. One of the highlights is an 18th-century sculpture depicting Jesus' family tree, the tree of Jesse which traces Jesus' ancestry back to Jesse, father of David. There are several Baroque altarpieces. Beneath the church are ancient catacombs where the church museum is located. Here you can see artifacts from the former Franciscan monastery. Although regular services are no longer held here there are regular classical music concerts and the occasional religious ceremonies including baptisms and weddings. The church is open to the public. Cais de Ribera. No alt text provided for this image. This Porto area is considered one of the most beautiful places in the world it is also one of the best places to get views across the city.
Ribera means riverside and Cais de Ribera is basically the district on the banks of the Dora River and running up into the heart of historic Porto's UNESCO World Heritage Site. In this area there is a network of narrow alleys lined with old buildings leading down to the Praca de Ribera or Ribera Square. Many of the buildings here are in bright pastel colors and in various stages of renovation and disrepair. The area was once a bustling medieval commercial area and today is a lively area of stores and sidewalk cafes and restaurants. In Ribera Square you can see a monumental fountain from the 1780s bearing Portugal's coat of arms. There is also a modern touch with José Rodríguez's modern cubic installation which stands over the remains of the 300-year-old fountain. From the quayside you can see the traditional port boats and Dom Luis Bridge. When the sun goes down the area comes alive with bars, cafes and nightclubs. In June Porto celebrates St. John's Day with fireworks and a street party in Cais de Ribera. Dom Luis Bridge. No alt text provided for this image. The Ponto de Dom Luis is an iconic bridge in Porto which was completed in 1886, at the time it was the longest iron arch in the world. The bridge has two parallel straight tracks separated by an elegant iron arch. On the upper level there is a metro line and on the lower level there are car lanes and pedestrian paths. The bridge is 395 meters long, 44.6 meters high and 8 meters wide. The bridge crosses the Dora River connecting Porto city center on the north bank with Vila Nova de Gaia on the opposite bank. The bridge was designed by Teofilo Sirig, who had co-designed another Porto bridge the D. Maria Pia Bridge with Gustav Eiffel. Visitors to Porto can take a cruise on the Dora River to see the Dom Luis Bridge and the other four bridges which cross the river in Porto. Another way of seeing the sights is to walk across the bridge's pedestrian walkway where there are views of the historic city center the Vila Nova de Gaia Port Wine Caves and the river. Don't confuse this bridge with the Maria Pia Bridge which is nearby and was built nine years earlier. Funicular do Skindies. No alt text provided for this image. The funicular line was constructed in 1891 and is still used by locals to get around the city and by tourists for the brilliant views. The funicular connects the Batalha, higher ground, by Cais de Gaia to the Ribera, Quayside, area at the base of Dom Luis Bridge. It is managed by the Metro do Porto which also manages the underground system although you can no longer use the Andante tickets on both systems. The funicular is a single track system which travels 281 meters and descends 61 meters. Although the upper 90 meters of the funicular line are within a tunnel travelers can get great views during the other section of the journey and during the last few minutes when the car emerges from the tunnel. Two funicular cars travel along the line each carrying up to 25 passengers and moving at about 5 meters per second. The journey covers several levels of gradient along the way and so the funicular cars employ self-leveling technology which looks like giant concertinas to keep the cars horizontal, no matter what gradient the track is at. It takes about 3 minutes to reach the top station once you have emerged from the tunnel and these 3 minutes are the best time to grab a shot of the breathtaking views. From the funicular you can see Dom Luis Bridge the Ribera Quayside, Mostero de Serra do Pilar, Cais de Gaia, wine lodges and the port boats sailing along the river Douro. To cover the same distance on foot you can take the Escadas dos Guedeas or the Escadas do Code Cal. Porto Cathedral. No alt text provided for this image. Se do Porto is a fortress-like cathedral where Prince Henry the Navigator was baptized and King John I and Princess Philippa of Lancaster wed in the 14th century. The building was constructed in the 12th century and has since undergone several changes creating a blend of architectural styles including Gothic, Baroque and Romanesque. It is located in Porto's oldest neighborhood, Moro de Sé. A 13th century tower stands alongside the cathedral. The church has retained its original Gothic rose window. One of the most beautiful parts of the church is the loggia on the north front which was one of the additions made in the 18th century by architect Nicolao Nassoni. The Gothic cloisters are another highlight of this religious site. The cloister walls are covered with beautiful blue and white 18th-century ceramic azulejos tiles. From the cloisters you enter the chapel of St. Vincent which was completed in the 16th century. In the chapel house there is a collection of sacred art. The chapel of the Holy Sacrament has an ornate altar with scenes created out of silver. When Napoleon's troops entered the city in 1809 the locals painted the altar to hide the silver and the altar was saved. Braga. No alt text provided for this image. Be ready, it is a historical city. Braga is more than 2,000 years old which makes it the oldest city in Portugal. 
It played a crucial role in Portuguese history and as the third largest city, after Lisbon and Porto, it has retained its importance over the years. It is mostly known for its devotion to tradition and religion. Braga is, in fact, also one of the oldest Christian cities in the world, dating back to the Roman Empire when it was called Bracara Augusta. Though the Romans ruled it, the city was actually founded by the Celts in 300 year BC. There are ancient buildings and churches around every corner, the majority of which proudly display their Baroque influence, including Portugal's oldest cathedral, Sé de Braga. Due to its long and intricate connection to religion and the Romans, it is known as the city of archbishops or the Portuguese Rome. But don't let the heritage fool you, even though Braga is a very traditional city, it is also full of life and young people. Braga is home to one of the largest universities in Portugal, University do Mijo with over 20,000 students, and is Portugal's tech startup hotbed. The city was even named the European Youth Capital in 2012. How to get there? Braga is located just 50 kilometers north from Porto and you can travel there easily. You can go by train from one of Porto's railway stations, São Bento or Campania, with a journey time of just one hour. Or you can travel by bus, which takes the same time to get there, approximately. What to see? This is a small city compared Porto, but still you will find plenty to see. Here's a list to help you plan your day trip from Porto to Braga. 1. Sé de Braga. No alt text provided for this image. As we already mentioned, Braga has the oldest cathedral in Portugal, Sé de Braga. This is an unmissable stop during your visit and we recommend starting here because not only is it the literal center of the historic city, but still remains the center of life in the city. 2. BOM Jesus do Monte, Funicular. No alt text provided for this image. Built in 1882, it was the first funicular in the Iberian Peninsula. It uses a water counterweight system and there are only seven of these funiculars in Portugal, but this is the oldest one in the world still in operation. The funicular takes you to up to the next must-see spot in Braga and also saves a bit of your energy for the elaborate staircase at the next stop. 3. BOM Jesus do Monte, Church and Sanctuary. No alt text provided for this image. This is the city's iconic monument. When you arrive at Braga there are two places that immediately stand out on the horizon. Two magnificent sanctuaries, one at the top of a mountain, which we'll talk about next, and one in the middle, BOM Jesus do Monte. The church itself is worth a visit but what really makes it one of the most beautiful spots in Portugal is the spectacular stairway right in front of it, the magnificent surrounding gardens, with various kinds of flowers, trees, fountains, caves, a lake, and a lookout point from which you can admire a stunning panoramic view over the whole city. This viewpoint will help you understand why this northern city is frequently described, by its inhabitants, as magnificent. 4. Sanctuary of Our Lady of Samaro. No alt text provided for this image. Yes, another sanctuary. This is the one that you will immediately spot upon arrival. Built on the top of the mountain, its distinctive white dome stands out from the city landscape. It is a peaceful place and, just like the BOM Jesus Sanctuary, it attracts many devotees every year during the pilgrimages. The great annual pilgrimage takes place on the first Sunday of June and on the third Sunday of August, so if you don't like crowds, these are dates to avoid. Since it's placed on the highest spot in the city, it provides an even more breathtaking panoramic view over the city. Where next? 